obviously I'm doing it myself quite a lot. Uh, and uh, yeah, I should encourage everybody to stop me, uh, interrupt, ask questions if there's anything that uh, you'd like to know more about or don't understand or something like that. Well, I think it's on. Uh, yeah, sound bite. Well, there's only a few uh, choices. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so 
Um, before getting too much further into the details of these particular problems, I want to just recall a little bit of background, and maybe some of this will overlap with Chuck's talk earlier in the week. So let's recall the definition of concordance. So two knots in a three-sphere are called concordant. And I'll write K1 semi Q K2. Um, if there exists a smoothly or a smooth embedding of an annulus into the three sphere cross interval. Uh, whose boundary gets mapped to our two knots. Okay. Um, and so, it's not too hard to see that this is an equivalence relation. Um, and only slightly more compli complicated is to see that, in fact, knots uh, modulo uh, this relation denote that by C form an abelian group. So, uh, to be fair, I should tell you uh, what this group is. So a group obviously has some operation. Um, so, throughout the talk, I'm going to try to stick to, when I talk about the concordance class, or the equivalence class of enough, I'll denote it in brackets. So I need to say, what's the, uh, how do I add these concordance classes? And it's given by the connected sum. So addition is played by connected sum, and so I take the connected sum k1 and k2, and consider the concordance class there. And I should also tell you what the inverse operation in this group is. And so this is uh, played by uh, taking the mirror image reversed. So I'll denote that by. Uh, yeah, so the mirror image is, of course, I change all the overcrossings to under. Uh, and, and vice versa in a given projection, and then reversing, I change the orientation of the one manifold, the knot. And so I also want to say what, what's zero, what's the identity element? And this is the equivalence class of the unknot. Okay, and the equivalence class of the unknot um, is somehow so special that, you know, we, we call it by a different name. Slice if, if it represents zero in the group, and equivalently, if K is the boundary of a smoothly embedded disk, smoothly properly embedded disk in the four ball.
And it's maybe not completely obvious what you do here, so I'll just point it out. So the, the, the most naive thing would be to say, well, I, I, I make my maps be topological embeddings, just continuous embeddings. Um, but then the group actually turns out to be trivial. Um, so what you want instead is that the map extends uh, to a, a cylinder across the disk. Um, this is called topological locally flat embeddings. Yeah. Okay. So good. Okay. So um, the question I'm going to be interested in today um, is. So I'd like to study subgroups of the concordance group, either in the topological or smooth setting. And so a question that I'd like to understand is, given some set of knots uh, indexed by you know, parameters that um, I'll denote the subgroup they generate, Thank you. 
is the PQ torus knot, the P1, Q1 torus knot. Uh, and then T, P1, Q1, P2, Q2 is the P2 cable, P2, Q2 cable of the previous torus knot. So if a torus knot sits on, a, it can be embedded on a torus. Um, and so if I take the neighborhood of the torus knot, P1, Q1, then uh, its boundary is a torus, and I can place the torus knot P2, Q2 on that. And then I can just, of course, go on. Um, and so the class of knots we're really dealing with here is exactly um, the class of iterated torus knots uh, that have a sort of a positivity condition, a, a growth condition. So. So I want all the coefficients to be positive, and I want um, the Q's at each stage, when I perform an extra iteration, I want the Q's to grow correspondingly. Um, okay, so this is uh, the class of iterated torus knots, and I'm interested in the subgroup that they generate inside concordance. So we're asking, so I'll denote script A be the subgroup to generate, and we're interested in what this group is. So, yeah, par partial motivation for this uh, question, well, I mean, in some sense, it, algebraic knots gave birth to concordance um, because uh, these plane curves they found uh, are, are singular maps of a disk into 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 C2, and the question is, you know, if they're slice, uh, then maybe you could replace that uh, singular disk by a smooth disk. Um, but uh, more precise motivation comes from the following question of Rudolph, which is essentially this question in 76. The question is, uh, how independent are not cobordism classes of links of singularities is what you actually asked. So I'll write down a conjecture which, uh, you know, he didn't state, but, you know, if he doesn't want to attribute it to himself, I'll attribute it to myself, or maybe Chuck would like to take, you know, take the burden of you know, responsibility. Um, so the conjecture is that uh, uh, this set is independent. And of course, this implies that uh, the set they generate is isomorphic to z to infinity. Um, but you know, it's sort of a very large infinity because there's no relations amongst these groups. Um, Right, so should point out some initial work in Slytherland about a year after uh, Rudolf asked the question is he used the uh, signature invariants. These are invariants coming from the cipher form of the knot to show that uh, uh, Torus knots. So, in light of this, you might have hoped that, uh, that, that this method would actually be able to handle all of the iterated torus knots um, and, and prove this conjecture. Uh, because there's a nice, he also knows, uh, showed how the signature behaves under this type of construction. Um, so, to, to make that a little bit more precise, and this I can work in the top logical concordance group, there's a, there's a surjective homomorphism 
to a more algebraic group, uh, in fact called the algebraic uh, concordance group. And this is essentially a cipher forms modulo uh, so-called metabolic forms, which you can just think about as the cipher forms of slice knots. Um, and so you could ask whether or not this homomorphism, uh, you know, is there anything, you know, so I have A contained in here, and you can ask whether or not this homomorphism restricted to A has kernels. You know, so does, the, does this algebraic object detect uh, or prove this conjecture? And so uh, Chuck and Paul Melvin Uh, this is three. They show that, in fact, uh, there are non-trivial elements in this kernel. Well, they show that there are elements in this kernel. So T uh, two thirteen minus T two three. contains this class. 
Um, but, and we saw that this class was in the kernel of the homomorphism to the algebraic importance group. Um, and we can actually pinpoint exactly uh, the subgroup of this z to infinity uh, that's in the kernel of that homomorphism. So the intersection of the z to infinity subgroup they generate is itself a z to infinity which is freely generated by not uh, sort of mirroring that form. So stronger and it uh, handles uh, something beyond just uh, algebraic knots, but um, and I, I think even within the, the realm of the, the question at hand, we could prove more, but I, uh, without um, some more insight, I don't know how to extend it much further. Although it, it's certainly possible that the technique that we used could uh, prove the conjecture. So the technique being uh, casting Gordon variance. Okay, so I'd like to switch gears a little bit now. So, the, so algebraic knots um, are a specific example of satellite knots. I'd like to talk now about another case of satellite knots. Okay, so. So I'm going to use the notation uh, DFK for the untwisted positive whitehead double of K. So how do we draw this knot? So Okay, um, 
you have to see this proposition, it's not that complicated. So you have this cylinder that connects K1 to K2 inside the three sphere cross I. And then the whitehead double is just a knot which sits in the tubular neighborhood of K1. And so I let that knot in the tubular neighborhood just follow along the cylinder throughout uh, the concordance connecting K1 to K2. That induces a concordance between the whitehead doubles. Um, so a consequence of this proposition is just that the whitehead double, you can view it as an operation from the, white, uh, from the concordance group to itself. And in fact, this holds for any satellite operation. So um, we're really interested in, you know, we have all these interesting self-maps from this group to itself. You want to know what, what's, what do they do to that group? And in terms of this, uh, in terms of this uh, language, we could uh, rephrase the conjecture saying the inverse image of zero is zero under this map. Okay, so, um, but if, I think one of the reasons this, this became uh, a rather well-known conjecture in the, in, the, in the area is because of a result of Friedman that says if the Alexander polynomial of a knot is one, this implies K is topologically sliced. So this is uh, a remarkable theorem and a corollary uh, due to the fact that the Alexander polynomial one always, sorry, due to the fact that the Whitehead double always has Alexander polynomial one is that um, uh, that the Whitehead double is always topologically sliced. And so you can say this is The map on the topological concordance group is the zero map. So in particular, it's a homomorphism, which doesn't hold the smooth concordance group. OK, so, um, but on the other hand, um, a work of, say, Akhalu, uh, Kassin, there's a lot of people involved here, um, so I'll say, Maybe I hope I don't leave some people out. Catherine, Gomp, and some of them in conjunction with others. Uh, Rudolph. Um, they show that that the whitehead double of many knots is not sliced in the t in the smooth category. And these results. Uh, until uh, Jake's discovery of his S invariant within Kamada homology all relied on gauge theory um, in some way. And I think uh, in the realm of just distinguishing individual knots, uh, the strongest that we can prove uh, at the moment comes from some work I did a few years ago. It says if I take iterated whitehead doubles of a knot, this is not zero in concordance, so it's not slice, provided that uh, the osvald uh concordance homomorphism is positive. Um, but what I'd like to do now is to think about this conjecture a little differently. Um, so uh, one thing you could do is you could, well, you could strengthen the conjecture significantly, right? And then try to disprove it. So, um, so, so what we'd like to do is rephrase, or um, talk about another conjecture. It says that this map uh, preserves independence. So in the smooth concordance group, uh, if you have some independent set of knots, then it's mapped to an independent set of knots. Um, so the theorem that we have in this direction it's some indication that maybe this conjecture is, is quite similar uh, to uh, the original one. So, this is right with Paul Kirk. says, if I look at the whitehead doubles 
of the 2 to, two to the n minus 1 torus knots in this set is independent. Um, and the result I mentioned uh, of Lutherland earlier says that the torus knots themselves were independent. So there's a verification of this refined conjecture in a particular case. Um, and again, this holds in somewhat more generality, but um, it doesn't hold for all torus knots by the method that we have so far. Okay, so the final uh, uh, problem. So, so we have this, uh, this set of knots now, the whitehead doubles. And, you know, they're not trivial inside the smooth concordance group, but they're trivial inside the topological concordance group. And, you know, it's that... Uh, I want to really examine that, that distinction between the smooth and topological concordance group. So we'll do that with topologically sliced knots. Yeah. This, yeah, so this, it, this is a technique uh, uh, that comes from SO3 gauge theory, as, as I mentioned, and it's a technique that was developed by Pendichel and Stern first, and then uh, extended uh, to the almost the context that we're dealing with by Feruda. Um, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more uh, in a moment. So, the last group is a topologically sliced group, so what we're interested in, so I have a natural map from the smooth concordance group to the topological concordance group, which just allows extra relations, extra equivalences. Um, and so we want to understand the kernel of this map. I'll denote, I'll denote that group by CTS. So this stands for topologically sliced knots. These are knots with don't bound smooth disks, but do bound topologic, topological locally flat disks. Okay. Um, and th this result here has as a corollary that this group is pretty big. So it contains a z to infinity sum n. I, and I should point out that this isn't the first proof of this. Um, uh, another proof that I know uh, comes from Indo, um, who also used uh, SO3 gauge theory. Um, so he also showed there was a Z to infinity inside this subgroup. Um, but his examples, so he had to, he had to construct some knots. Uh, and their corresponding concordance classes uh, that generate the seed infinity. But his example is somewhat similar. I mean, they use this Friedman theorem. So they all had Alexander polynomial equal to 1. Well, you could ask, I mean, do all the examples have Alexander polynomial 1? Is this the only way that you get topologically sliced knots? Well, if I have um, K with delta k equals 1, then I can take k connect sum um, j with j slice, smoothly slice, and the Alexander polynomial is not equal to 1, there's many such examples, and then you get something, so this implies k connect sum j is in uh, this subgroup, but but it doesn't have Alexander polynomial one. But somehow this is a this is sort of a stupid way to construct examples. Or well, I don't know. I mean, it's a way, but it's not really getting at the heart of the issue, right? Because you know, within the equivalence relation that we allow in a smooth world, this thing is an Alexander polynomial one knot. I just take a smooth concordance from k connects on j to k, and I get something with Alexander polynomial 1. So we want to mod out by this type of phenomenon and really get at the heart of the problem. And <clears throat> the way we can do this is let's let C delta uh, denote the subgroup generated by concordance classes um, where. Of not with Alexander polynomial one. So, if you 
together, these two knobs would be in the same uh, concordance class in this subgroup. And the question then is whether these two groups are equal. Um, this group is certainly contained within the other uh, as a subgroup by Friedman's, uh, by Friedman's result. Um, well, and the answer is no. Uh, it's very far from being equal. This is joined with Chuck and Danny Ruberman. The result is that if I consider the quotient group, as I have the subgroup uh, C delta within the topologically sliced subgroup, um, and this this quotient group uh, is infinitely generated. Okay. And I should remark um, the the proof of this theorem uh, has some other consequences uh, related to various three-dimensional bordism groups and also to uh, link concordance, but I won't get into those today. Great. So in the remaining 15 minutes, I'd like to uh, give an overview of some of the techniques that were involved in the proof of these theorems. Um, you know, the details of any one are uh, somewhat complicated, but I'd like to give you a kind of a pictorial view of what, what's going on here. So we have this restate the theorems, or parity of them, here. So the first is that I have this uh, collection of algebraic knots, which are independent of the topological group. Uh, the second was that these white hat doubles are independent. And the smooth concordance group, and the third is that I have this Z to infinity sum n, or subgroup, sorry, of the quotient group. Okay. So, so again, so the first one uses uh, these Cassie and Gordon invariants. Uh, the second uses uh, gauge theory. And the third uses the D invariants with the correction terms. Okay. Um, so, so the the one thing that these three uh, techniques all have in common um, is that they pass from the concordance group to a three-dimensional bordism group. So, and this is, a, this is a very common, you know, this is not a new idea in concordance. But so, given K, so, so I'll try to say the one thing that all these things have in common. So given a not K, uh, we transfer its concordance class into a bordism class. And in this case, for all three of the theorems, this, we do this with a two-fold branch cover. So that, um, so if uh, K is slice, this implies that uh, branched uh, two-fold cover is the boundary of some four manifold Q, where this is a Z2 homology ball. And so it's this fact that we want to obstruct in each situation. This is a, this is a lemma that can be proved uh, by homology. first step. And then, uh, in each situation, um, we, we have some invariant
to obstruct this. So I want to obstruct the two-fold branch cover from bounding a homology ball. And, well, you have to compute the invariance in whatever case at hand. So, so uh, I guess the meat in, both, in, in each of them, well, is uh, computing in a sense. And in each case, at some point, we need to know how these invariants behave under uh, three-dimensional blooming operations. So, you know, you can phrase it really as uh, under satellite operations or sometimes in the case of close three manifolds, we, we call this splicing. So, blooming three manifolds along Tori. Okay, so um, in the first case, uh, the invariant is the casting gordon invariant. So, and I should uh, preface everything that I'm about to say by I'm going to give uh, a very oversimplified view of all these invariants. Um, so, slightly more technical, and especially from the notation side, so I'm going to suppress a lot of things. Um, so, for those of you in the know, um, this won't maybe quite be the whole story. So if I have a knot uh, K, I have its two-fold branch cover. <clears throat> and now, given uh, a homomorphism from H1 of the two-fold branch cover, the singular homology, to a cyclic group, um, call this chi, to this pair, we have something called a casting gordon invariant. Tau, okay. okay. So what is this invariant? Well, um, uh, it's, a, it's a bit class, really. So it's some element in a bit group. And this is, you know, this is uh, a kind of more complicated analog of the algebraic concordance group that I mentioned earlier. This is, we have um, uh, non-singular permission forms over uh, field of rational functions, modulo metabolic forms. So for those of you who were in Chuck's talk on Monday, he also used a casting gordon invariant, but he was using a signature invariant, so he wasn't stating in terms of forms, I believe. Um, and he also wasn't using quite wasn't using quite this invariant, um, and um, the, the, the distinction comes about from this, this T. Anyway, um, what is this? This is really, this is the difference of a, of an intersection form
gross notational abuse here, I'm going to refer to almost every concordance invariant in this talk uh, by tau. Um, and in each section, it will have a completely different meaning. So, where's Robert? I look forward to your comments. <laughs> So, so Lydia tells us how Tau behaved under satellite. And it's, well, the difference of Tau of the 2Q cable of a not K and Tau of the 2Q cable of the unknot or the 2Q torus knot is some kind of invariant associated to, um, to the, knot that you're, the knot that you're cabling. So this is a this is, you can think about this, this is like the, uh, the algebraic concordance class. Oh, okay, so that's in the, in the group that I mentioned earlier. And so I apologize to, if you actually can't see back there. Uh, so, so we have the element in the algebraic concordance group uh, of cypherforms mod metabolic site reforms represented for the knot that you're cabling. So we have this difference formula, but you know, just because you have a formula in this case doesn't mean that it's easy to prove the theorem, because this, uh, you know, this formula had existed for quite a while. Um, and, the, and the reason it's hard is because this just tells you that you have some element in this crazy fit group. Um, but in, in the end, we have to uh, you know, distinguish whether or not that's zero. And so the proof is somehow to interplay uh, two maps from this group. Uh, one is the, you know, if I have a non singular matrix, I can take its determinant. And this gives an obstruction to being zero um, in an appropriate sense. And another is you can take its signature. And somehow the determinant is, comes about, you know, basically this is a twisted Alexander polynomial. Whereas the signature, well, it's a signature, but I don't know how to compute it. So, but somehow the twisted Alexander polynomial tells you about the jumps in the signature. So it's kind of an interplay of those two facts. This is analogous to you know, the fact that you know, the Alexander polynomial factoring in this way is an obstruction to being twice. That's what you get from the determinant uh, homomorphism. It's not really determinant, but I believe it is. So this is the fox Miller condition in the classical story, and then it gives you a refined obstruction here. But that doesn't tell you anything about being infinite order. You know, this obstructs, you know, like the figure eight, but it doesn't say anything about the figure eight being infinite order. So then we have to, you know, somehow say what this, this, yeah, so it's an interplay between these two facts. And that's what, you know, we really added here. So, the remaining two theorems, um, so, the obstruction that we have in theorem 2 is, so I have the branch two-fold cover of the sum of whitehead doubles of knots. And what I do is I take, so that manifold splits as a connected sum itself, and I take a natural cohortism from that to the branch double covers of each of the whitehead doubles. So this is a rational homology ball, and um, I extend it by, by this cohortism. And so the idea is that I take one of those manifolds, say, dk1, and show that it bounds some other four manifold, um, which has nice gauge theoretic properties, which I'll call, so, one, show, this particular branch two-fold cover is the boundary of W, uh, which satisfies property I. Property I means that uh, I can build a one-dimensional family of instantons with a single singular point. And so excising uh, a neighborhood of that singular point, 
I get some smooth uh, manifold with a single endpoint. And then if I show uh, that such a, such, a, such a moduli space exists, um, it also comes with a number. So P is a class in H2 of W. And if I can show that the minimal churn Simons invariant shall also denote by tau, And it's not, you know, this is the notation somehow that was established. I don't understand why all concordance invariants gravitated towards the notation tau over time, but I unfortunately didn't control this, so. <laughs> I see. <laughs> okay. Well, so I want to show that this, this is the, so if I can show that the minimal turn Simons invariants of all the other i, so this is the, yeah, this is, say, I have one of my manifolds, well, the branch double cover of the white double of the first knot. If I can show that all the others uh, their minimal churn Simons invariant is bigger than the square of this two-dimensional cohomology class. And this implies um, Q doesn't exist. And the reason is that if, uh, if Q did exist, then I could extend the moduli space. I could, from the moduli space I had by construction uh, for W in the definition of this, this property I, I could construct a new moduli space on the putative manifold. Um, but this condition on turn simons invariant uh, guarantees compactness of this moduli space. Um, so, 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 I would have a compact manifold well, with an odd number of endpoints. So, I would have this situation, but it would be compact. So, I don't know how to draw that because obviously it doesn't exist. Um, so, that's where the contradiction arises. So, I started a little bit late. So, uh, in the remaining uh, one minute. Uh, the, the third technique uses the correction terms, as I said. So the point here is that if the branch twofold cover, so, so we want to obstruct K being concordant to J with Alexander polynomial equal to 1. So we want to show that we have knots, and in fact we have many knots uh, that are not concordant to any J satisfying this condition. And so what we look at is, suppose that, suppose that K was concordant to J. Then the branch double cover of the concordance, the cylinder connecting K to J, would give rise to a uh, Z2 homology concordism, say W, connecting uh, the branch double cover of K to the branch double cover of J. And this manifold, since it has Alexander polynomial 1, satisfies uh, it has H1 equal to 0. And now we have some invariants coming from Hagar Ford homology called the D invariants. These are indexed by elements in H1 of the manifold. And the thing that's essential about them is that they're rational homology, uh, in particular, Z2 homology cohortism invariants. So if this manifold existed, then every, so I have some homology class in this manifold, every homology class that extends over the cohortism, you know, has the same D invariant. As, as this manifold, but there's only one homology class here. So what this is telling me is I have a bunch of D invariants for the branch double cover of the knot that I start with that all have the same value. And that's the obstruction that we use there together with quite a bit of algebra and um, various computations of the knot plural homology of many, many knots. So I'll stop there. Like 
construction is that you Then all you would take would be proving this conjecture and Ruben's slice would be done. But I don't know how to do 